All right. Live and wanted to welcome and acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded territories of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples, land and water. I want to welcome you to our Women and Wales First Poetry and a Climate of Change uh, gathering of videos and poetry and conversation. I'm really excited to have this day um, come into being. And I have to start with saying that it would not at all be possible without um, the work of Jayun, who's one of our uh, participants in the cohort, but has been the creative assistant for this project. And without the incredible work also of Carol Roscoe, who's been an intern for the Seattle Civic Poet role, my role, it's not possible for all the connections that have been made and all the support that has been given. And you will see a list of people we say thank you to from um, Diane and Jamie at the Space Needle and with thanks for um, Humanities Washington our, for our special guest poet, our Washington State Poet Laureate, the whaletrail.org, which started with a conversation with Donna and I months ago, and all the work of um, Andrea Walls, who has created a lot of the um, images that you've seen to welcome people into, into this Women in Wales project, as well as, of course, my role as Seattle Civic Poet. It would not be possible <laughs> to be doing this work without the Office of Arts and Culture, um, Irene Gomez, who works with everybody to make things happen and the people behind the scenes like Erica and Otz. There's too many people to name and I will come back to thanking people. Um, so thank you for joining us. And it's so strange and also wonderful. It's so strange to not see the faces of people um, that I know and love and have never met and love um, that are out here and listening to us. but welcome energetically and each other. I want to start without further ado. I hope you had a chance to grab your cocktail or mocktail. I'm having mm, water um, in my poetry and buses bottle. Don't hate me. It's from, from the project. But yeah, it's my favorite mocktail right now. Um, I want to welcome our start by telling you all, so you all can listen and know, as well as our guests, what we're going to do today. First, we're welcoming um, Rena Priest, who's our Washington State Poet Laureate, and Nancy Mariano, who's going to has a video to share. They are two of the people whose um, poems were selected from the call for submissions for poetry focused on women in Wales and the call for to write a pantoon. And so they're a special guest today. After we hear from them, we're gonna I'm gonna have a chance to introduce Donna to you from the Whale Trail and and as well as the project of uh, women in Wales. And you'll have a lovely presentation from Donna. And then some incredible videos of the poems that were written by our cohort, uh, the seven of us working under the amazing guidance of um, Jamie and Diane at the Space Needle. So you're going to watch some video performances, and then we're going to come back and have a conversation with our panelists after some introductions. And hopefully, as an audience, you'll have a lot of questions, and we'll have some answers for you. And uh, we'll close out with my video poem and more thank you. So without further ado, um, Stay glued to your seat. And I'd like to welcome Rena Priest. Rena Priest is a poet and an enrolled member of the Lummi Nation. She has been appointed to serve as Washington State's Poet Laureate for the term of 2021 to 2023, April. She is a Vadon Foundation Fellowship recipient and an Allied Arts Foundation professional. Professional Poets Award winner. And please learn more about Rena at renapriest.com. And following Rena, um, you will hear 
a video by Nancy Mariano, pronouns she and they, is a multidisciplinary creative of Shahamora heritage who was born and raised in Kirkland, Washington. Her mediums include, but are not limited to, poetry, songwriting, and dance. Her work is a love letter to exploring her own struggles and navigating diaspora, emotional trauma, and body dysmorphia. Okay, without further ado, welcome, Rena. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here to share this poem with you. Um, thank you to Jordan and everybody who helped organize this event. Um, so I was really excited to respond to this call. Um, Pantoom is a really wonderful form that I love to work in. And so uh, I'll just go ahead and share this poem with you. Silence from the Deep. How do we mistake desolation for peace? These daughters stolen, these daughters starved, waves say hush along the beach. Under the waves, there is no reprieve. These daughters stolen, these daughters starved. The matriline dwindles as girls go missing. Under the waves, there is no reprieve. From human noise, pollution, hunger, the matriline dwindles as girls go missing. The world is a mirror of our hearts. Look away from human noise, pollution, hunger. Everything is endangered or going extinct. The world is a mirror of our hearts. Look away so as not to see how under the waves everything is endangered or going extinct. When orcas no longer sing, will we see? Will we see how under the waves, the waves that say hush along the beach, when orcas no longer sing, will we see how we mistook desolation for peace? And so that um, was inspired by the call um, for submissions and also by an article that I read in which Ken Balcom, um, whale researcher, was talking about the, the, the baby whales that have been lost over the years when people get their hopes up for a return um, in the population and then the, the, the babies don't make it either because they starve or because um, for various reasons, including whale capture in the 1970s. So it's a very sad era, but I'll go ahead and pass my turn along to the next poet. And thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank Humanities Washington and the Washington State Arts Commission, who are the sponsors of the like Poet Lord. Hashka. Reading to my Pacifica ancestors. I would like to dedicate this reading to my Pacifica ancestors. We crave the salt of the sea. The ocean was our freedom. At night, when waves would settle, we looked to the moon with wonder. The ocean was our freedom. Indulging in the land was our joy. We looked to the moon with wonder, thanking the gods for their gifts. Indulging in the land was our joy. Full bellies giggled and gossiped, thanking the gods for their gifts. How could we ever repay them? Full bellies giggled and gossiped, knowing that creatures died for our survival. How could we ever repay them? We do not take their sacrifice for granted. Knowing that creatures died for our survival, we forge ahead in our journey. We do not take their sacrifice for granted. We travel thousands of miles in their honor. We forge ahead in our journey. We lose loved ones, our numbers dwindle. We travel thousands of miles in their honor. With sorrow, we seek refuge. We lose loved ones, our numbers dwindle. But we cannot let their stories be erased. With sorrow, we seek refuge in proclaiming, everyone must know our legacy. We cannot let their stories be erased, people and animals alike. 
Everyone must know our legacy. We craved the salt of the sea. Thank you. Thanks so much. Wow. I need a moment. I uh, thank you both. And it's one thing in the paper, but another to hear it, the words held by your voices. Um, I would like to introduce this project, Women in Wales First Poetry in a Climate of Change. I really do need to take a moment. So this project is born from dreams uh, that I had. Uh, my home on, that I no longer live in on Beacon Hill. And there were gray whales that were coming to my bedroom window in my dreams. And I, I was married at the time, so it was our bedroom window. And the, and the whales would come and rise and they were looking and the garden was water. So the first summer I was very disturbed thinking it was a warning and very protective of and it, of the wilderness trip that I was leading, so that perhaps something was gonna happen on that 17 day trip with the kids and nothing did. And then the next summer, and uh, I had the dreams again. And so, as I had earlier, I was I wanted to know what the whales wanted me to do. I, I immediately felt like they wanted me to do something, but I didn't know anything. So I became uh, I went and started studying with um, Washington State University has this uh, program called Beach Watchers. So you know it's a few terms where you're immersed in um, understanding the health of Puget Sound and all the ways that we can protect it and the health and situations of our marine mammals. And so of course, what I became aware of most was the situation faced by our endangered orcas. Simultaneously, I was uh, studying environmental health uh, in, in human lives and epigenetics as I was curious and carried curiosity about, you know, what is the legacy of an enslaved ancestor in my body? And then ecogenetics came into the picture um, a lot through the work of the University of Washington. So how those things might all be happening as seeking answers to questions. And in that, what I began to learn, what I was carrying the knowledge of of the human experience into the work with the beach watchers. And that is when I realized all that we had in common humans as bodies of water and the constant stream of toxins applied to our food and our water and our containers and our healthcare um, products, our personal care products, our shampoos, our lotions, our furniture, our computer, all these things that we can't get away from and some of the things that we, if we know about can control, especially at times and specifically as women when we may be more vulnerable in our bodies to the effects of these exposures. And one of them sadly is the stuff that we're lavishly putting on our hands to protect us from this coronavirus. So what I want you to know is that the health of our human bodies our, what our, our internal ecosystems, um, what the doctors call our internal environment, is inextricably linked to the living beings in Puget Sound. It's including our uh, southern resident population of killer whales. And most importantly, leaving here, I hope you understand that as women, um, it's, if you're like me, you have your yummy stores of fat that give you curves um, that because of that, we share risks that the marine mammals face. Um, and specifically as Black, Indigenous, Asian, 
Latinx women, we face cumulative risks from historic and current harms. And we also bring with us cumulative benefits and cumulative joys in our life. So part of this celebration is recognizing um, how important those cumulative benefits and cumulative joys may be to uh, offsetting the, the risks that we face. And that's all I'm going to say for now. And in that conversation, it led to meet, me to meet um, just a couple years ago, that feels like more, uh, Donna Sandstrom. And um, I'll read Donna's bio. We had a wonderful conversation and it's taken years a little bit more than a year and a half for this to come to life. Donna Sandstrom is the founder director of the Whale Trail, a series of places to watch whales, dolphins, and other marine mammals from shore along the west coast of the US and Canada. In 2002, she was a community organizer in the effort to rescue and return Springer, an orphaned orca, to her pod. Inspired by that collaborative success, she found the Whale Trail, founded the Whale Trail in 2008 with an overarching goal of recovering the Southern residents from the threat of extinction. Donna is the author of a middle grade nonfiction book, Orca Rescue, published by Kids Ken Press for release in 2021. And I'm very excited. Also, it's not written here, but Donna is also a poet. So this was meant to be. And please welcome Donna Sandstrom and uh, the presentation Donna will share with us. Uh, you're muted. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and in such wonderful company, a whole pod of poets. It's about as good as it gets. Um, I'm um, also moved by the poems we just heard. What a gift this is to all of us, Jordan. Thank you for putting it on and Jay and Carol for organizing it. So I'm just gonna dive into the presentation. Um, and we'll go from there. Okay, are we on? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I call this talk Voices Rising for the Southern Residents because I believe and have experienced that to move forward into this next phase of the world, we women especially and poets have a unique and really important role to play in singing the new world into existence and harmonizing that with the whales. Um, I'm gonna, I've got three main things I wanna talk about and I'm gonna cover a lot in a short amount of time, um, but hopefully we can get through it all. I'm gonna, first of all, just kind of establish a little bit about the Southern residents for people who might not know them. Talk about Springer, um, as Jordan mentioned, it was a life-changing thing for me to be part of the project to rescue and return this orca. And that inspired me to start the whale trail back in 2008. Um, and then I was a member of Governor Inslee's task force in 2018. And we've had, which further clarified the work ahead of us. And, but we have seen some successes. My goal here is to inspire all of us to understand that we each have a role to play in recovering these whales, which means giving them their chance to have their next moment on the planet, these whales who have been here for tens of thousands of years. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit. I came into this whole uh, whole thing from a somewhat, um, well, my story is I was raised in California. I grew up near the beach. I didn't have, I love whales and dolphins, I think as everyone does, but I didn't have a special affinity for them until I moved to Seattle in the early 80s and I began dreaming about them. 
there's something about dreams and women, whale dreams and women that is a powerful and ancient connector. Um, specifically for me, I dreamt of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, a place that I'd never seen and I or had been to or even knew of when I first moved here. And I dreamt I was hovering over a map. And as I was hovering over the map, suddenly 80 dorsal fins burst through the map and it became real water. And they were 80 orcas headed east in the strait. So I woke up and I went to my dictionary. This was long before Google <laughs> and looked up who were these orcas and what were they doing in my dreams? And that question and that experience really started me on the path to the rest of my life. I quickly learned, I, I read the book Orca the Whale Called Killer, which I'd like to recommend to you all as still the best uh, reference and stories, reference for orcas by Eric Hoyt. So orcas are the top predator in the sea. They're sometimes called the wolves of the sea. They work together to catch their prey. They're the largest members of the dolphin family. They're playful, curious, and intelligent. So as fierce as they are, they're also friendly and gentle. How do we tell them apart? We tell them apart by their dorsal fins and by their saddle patches. Male dorsal fins can get to be up higher than six feet and females are generally about two to three feet. And the saddle patches are those white blotches behind the, um, behind the dorsal fins, unique to every orca, like a fingerprint. We can also tell them apart by their vocalizations. Each pod has its own unique call. Orcas are worldwide. They're one of the most widely distributed marine mammals. They live in every ocean and both poles. And around the world, there's different ecotypes of orcas. Some of them eat fish, some of them eat mammals, and they differ um, in where they live, what they eat, the, their family structures, and some, somewhat in their morphology. You can see from this poster done by our friend Orca, Orca sorry, Uko Gorder, that um, the orcas are very close, but there are differences among the ecotypes around the world. Here in the Northwest, we've got three orca ecotypes, bigs or transient orcas eat marine mammals like seals, porpoises, or other whales. The resident orcas who eat fish eaters, especially Chinook, and the offshores who live in the deeper ocean and rarely are seen close to the coast. The Northern resident orcas, there's a group around the Northern end of Vancouver Island, the Northern residents, and the Southern residents live around the Southern end of Vancouver Island and along the Pacific coast between Tofino and Monterey, California. And what sets them apart is their large family groups organized around the mothers. They're matriarchal. And this is one incredible fact about orcas. It's getting more and more clear. What they eat and how they hunt is cultural, taught to them by their families. Well, physically, they could probably eat just about anything. They are the top predator in the sea. Again, what they eat and how they hunt is cultural. So whether they hunt seals or whether they hunt salmon or whether they hunt, they flip over sharks is all something they've learned from their families. And they're conservative. They don't seem to change from the patterns they've learned. As I mentioned, the, the Southern resident orcas and the Northern residents live in matriarchal pods that stay with their mothers their whole lives. So when we see whales here, where I live in West Seattle, when we see the whales here, you can see four generations of whales in the same pod. We've got three pods of Southern resident orcas, J pod, K pod, and L pod. And I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about some highlights about each of them. J pod spends most time in the Salish Sea and um, they've just had two new calves. You've probably all heard about. So there's 25 whales altogether. Um, some of the most well-known Southern resident orcas came from J pod. Granny, who was estimated to be over hundred when she died. Ruffles, who was one of the most easily identified male orcas with a wavy dorsal fin. And Tahlequah, the whale who so memorably carried her calf for uh, when, when she lost her calf in the summer of 2018. Happily, she's got a new calf of her own now. K-Pod is the smallest pod. They're often travel with the Jays. And K-Pod we're uh, worried about because uh, while pregnancies have been observed, they haven't had new calves in a while. And L-Pod is the largest pod, 34 whales. Um, and they travel the farthest. They're often seen down near Monterey or even up as far as Duplulet. 
And you can see um, what's unique about the Southern residents. They're one of the most well-studied animal populations on earth. Since these photo ID studies began back in the 70s, every individual is known. So we can construct the family trees and um, groups like the Center for Well Research or the Department of Fisheries and Oceans keep track of the pods. And for all of us living here in the Central Sound, you know, the orcas live here too, and they are often seen here October through February following the winter chum runs. That's a spy hopping orca right here in the Central Sound. And of course, humans and orcas have always had, there is an inter intersection where humans and orcas have met for as long as they both have been here. Um, First Nations and Native American cultures um, have always treated the orcas like relatives. They are different than other whales in that they were never hunted. And you can see that in the stories, songs, sculpture, and art that resounds throughout the Northwest. It's a deep, deep, old connection. And that connection was severely disrupted in the last century. Uh, between 1965 and 1976, more than 60 orcas were captured for display in aquaria. Southern residents especially were bore the brunt of the captures. Um, they lost more than 40, 40 members of the population, which was probably just a little over 100. We don't really know how many there were because the orcas hadn't been counted before the captures started. And of those, there's only two that are still alive today, Corky, a northern resident orca at SeaWorld San Diego, and Lolita, who's, or Tokate, who's at the Miami Seaquarium. The captures were stopped by Washington State, um, which sued to stop the per NOAA fisheries from issuing the permits for the captures. And happily, the Southern residents recovered from that. They began a climb, their population grew and grew and grew to about 98 orcas in 1996. And in the meantime, so I, I, my curiosity about the whales turned from a hobby into a passion. And then in um, 1992, I organized my first public presentation, Paul, featuring Dr. Paul Spong, who'd proposed returning Corky the orca to her family up in British Columbia. I hosted a public event uh, called Orca Fest 95 with a group of friends and then a symposium about Lolita in 1996. Through it all, I was I started waitressing, I was technical editing, and then I, I landed happily at Adobe Systems through my love for Macintosh computers, uh, which is right after my love for whales. <laughs> and it all came together, all these threads of my life came together in 2002 when a little orca showed up near where I live in West Seattle. And a ferry quartermaster um, discovered her and alerted my friend Mark, a, an orca researcher. And sure enough, it was a two-year-old juvenile orca who, unfortunately, her saddle patch was really obscured. So we no one knew who she was. She wasn't a southern resident orca, and it was a big mystery among everybody along the coast. Who is this whale? Orcas, as we've learned, are never by themselves. So it was highly unusual to see an orca by itself, much less a calf. And it was from her calls, that's Joe, Ocean, uh, Joe Olson, a, re, a hydrus. She had been last one seen with her mother in 2000 and um, her mother had disappeared and it was presumed she died too, but she didn't. And somehow she made it down to Seattle. So then the question was, what should we do? She was lost alone and 300 miles away from home and there was no way she would re find her family or they would find her. And we, uh, NOAA Fisheries held a town meeting and we encouraged them that they should try to return her home and not send her to an aquarium and that we would support them if they did that. And we, the community, encouraged them to um, try an in situ rehabilitation, rehabilitate her somewhere in Puget Sound instead of through an aquarium. And happily, they agreed to do that. So the NOAA, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Vancouver Aquarium committed to the first ever orca reintroduction. We kept our end of the bargain and a group of seven groups joined together and got uh, in-kind donations and funding for the project. She was rescued, rehabilitated, and I wish I wish I had an hour to tell you this story. It's a really good one, but I'm just gonna race through it right now. Um, and as one example of trying to keep her healthy um, and wild, they put salmon in her pen through a tube so she wouldn't get used, wouldn't associate uh, 
people with food and, but she was pretty smart. <laughs> she knew where the food was. And um, after nearly a month in the pen, she was ready to go home. She was carried on a donated catamaran up to Johnstone Strait, where the First Nations people from Alert Bay gathered. And when she was returned to, she was, uh, the catamaran came around the corner and the whole place lit up with drumming and singing. And she was lifted uh, one last time, put in her pen, welcomed home by the uh, Bill Cranmer, the chief from Alert Bay. And then two countries had worked together to make this happen. And now the rest was up to the whales. No one even knew if her family would be there, but it was timed so that it would be. And um, her pod, her grandmother and her aunts came to get her the very next day with a timing that still can only awe us all. So Springer showed us all that first of all, orcas can go home again. And Springer's come back year after year after year, and today she has two calves of her own. Um, to get the whale home, we had to learn how to work together. And above all, we put the whales first. And those are the lessons that I think have bearing for the Southern residents today. She transformed relationships across countries, organizations, cultures. And her biggest le legacy for me is that she gave me hope. I know what happens when people work together for the whales now. And while Springer thrived, JK and L pods were in trouble. Their numbers kept falling and falling. And one solution we had, or that I thought was we needed just to let people know where the orcas lived and that watching them from shore was better for them than watching them from boats. So we founded the Whale Trail in 2008 with a team of partners. We grew year after year. Um, each site has a page on our website. We inaugurated the Whale Trail in 2010 at Salt Creek, which is just west of Port, Port Angeles. The Lower Elwha Clowland Tribe welcomed us, and it turned out there was a significant site to the tribe, which we didn't we didn't know when we picked that site. And it made me realize, though, that the Whale Trail we're not inventing anything; we're just naming something that's always existed. We added two signs in every ferry in 2011. And uh, in 2014, we expanded to California and in 2015 to British Columbia. And now we've got more than 130 sites with throughout and beyond the um, Southern Resident Orca range. And we also do programs and tool programs like uh, lecture series. We had a writing contest in the fall. And when the whales are near, we pass up binoculars to make sure people can see them. And while we were making some progress with the, the Southern residents, their population kept going down, it kept declining. And in 2018, to address this, Governor Inslee established a task force. And the task force, so I'm going to talk for a minute here about the, the threats in detail that are still a problem for the orcas. There's not enough food, there's too many toxins, too much noise, and climate change. So the threats work together by when the whales, the, the whales uh, toxins bioaccumulate in the orcas. So they're stored in the mother's milk and their blubber. When they're stressed or hungry, that's released into their bloodstream and makes it more susceptible to disease. And of course, noise makes it harder for them to find their food, so they're more likely to be stressed and hungry. It's all of these things working together. We can't take our eyes off of any of them. We have to address them all. I'm just gonna race through this quickly here, but. Salmon, the orcas depend on salmon that comes from a variety of places, Klamath River, Sacramento, Columbia, Snake River. Right here in Puget Sound, the winter chum is really important to them, and Fraser River. So to um, protect the whales, to, to feed the whales, we need to pay attention to all those watersheds and to salmon throughout their life cycle. Toxin accumulations like PCBs, PBDEs, and plastics, as Jordan mentioned earlier, go into the ocean, bioaccumulate in the orcas. And one, a few things that we can do to prevent that is to stop using products that are going to harm the orcas or their prey. And finally, noise and disturbance from boats comes from large ships, the whale watching industry, recreational boats, and even kayaks and canoes can disturb an orca if it changes its behavior when, it's, when he or she is trying to hunt something. 
And just recently we found out that orcas actually stop foraging, female orcas stop foraging when vessels approach closer than 400 yards. Um, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm gonna race through this. Um, one good, one great outcome of the task force is that um, on the task force, I championed a licensing program for commercial whale watching as one solution to reducing noise around the Southern residents. And that took, the rules for commercial whale watching were just implemented. So now there's no whale watching on the Southern residents October through June and limited whale, whale watching July through September. This is going to give the whales a better chance to forage, rest and socialize. And I think this is a huge triumph of public will and a, and a process. Um, so where we are, we are at now, the task force recommended 49 actions to save the Southern residents. And I think those are a blueprint for recovery. I encourage you all to get familiar with them. And an ORCA recovery coordinator has been hired at the, is getting hired at the, um, at the state. And finally, we need to keep moving forward in science, understanding what we know in policy and in art. So this is, I just wanted to spend a quick minute talking about how do we move forward together as poets, especially. First, we have a clear, clear vision of what success looks like. Noah's goal for recovering the orcas is essentially adding 120, reaching 120 orcas in 20 years. Um, creating a culture of healthy change. I, in my experience, the biggest question we face, not just for the orcas, but with the natural world is, are whales here just for our entertainment or to meet our needs? Or do they have a right to exist for their own sake? This is a shifting paradigm um, that must change if we, want, if we want them to go on. Our right role with them is to give them the right to save passage and a chance to go on, to repair and restore what we ourselves have wounded. and. Doing that means confronting an entrenched status quo that is resisting this change and will polarize rather than invite dialogue. So this is the necessary work in front of all of us as poets in policy or as poets. So I wanna encourage you all to find your voice and your pod, find a few allies at least, and to tell the truth, inspire the change, and watch your dreams. I know for sure we're in this together right now, and the whale need us more. Whales need us now more than ever. Each of you in this panel and every one of you listening has a role to play. So I want to say thank you again for um, inviting me, and let Springer's success show us the way. Thank you. That was wonderful, Donna. I uh, I'm going to be careful of of time, but I, and I don't uh, know whether there's some questions from the audience. But um, I believe you're staying till the end when we're going to have our Q and A. And I okay, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, I do, I do want to say. And it's weird because I can't see everyone, but I hear you. Um, I never knew that you started uh, Whale Trail in 2010. So the that's not a coincidence that the dreaming and the start of my work. And it, I, I, yeah, so if other people need evidence of, of, um, ancient beings who communicate with us. I don't know. I, I feels pretty obvious to me. That That's just me. So um, thank you a thousand times for that education. And people write down your questions. I want to um, introduce, where are we on here? Um, I'm going to read folks' bios, and we're going to watch the video performances. And I'm reading the bios of our cohort. Uh, and as you can tell, we can't help but smile. I'm pretty happy about it. Um, I'm reading them in order of 
the videos or what I believe will be the showing of the videos. So our first is uh, Rashina Fountain, and who is originally from Chicago. Rashina Fountain is a multi-genre writer and interdisciplinary educator living in Seattle. Fountain is a past Walker Communications Fellow with National Audubon. She is currently an MFA prose candidate at the University of Washington, Seattle, where she is working on an environmental essay collection. And Rashina's website is rashinafountain.com. Followed by Rashina is Ebony Wellborn. Ebony is originally from the South, but has been an active community member in King County for the last three years. As her life has progressed, Ebony has learned just how interconnected we are to our non-human friends. Kamna Shastri is a community journalist with a background in sociology and environmental studies. Kamna is especially interested in the messiness of cultural identity and breaking down the false distinction between humanity and nature. Poetry has been my lifelong method of self-expression, she said. Next is Alida Marcel Cervantes, or Mari, for her familia, is a self-identified third world woman who grew up in a small town in Guadalajara, Mexico. She co-wrote and published a chapter in the anthology, Gendering Globalization, Globalizing Gender, Post-Colonial Perspectives, edited by Gil Klauskin. She was also a Tin House Workshop attendee and Dream Yard Fellow 2020, a scholarship recipient for a scholarship for, for Frost Place Conference in 2020, and the International San Miguel de Writers Conference. She currently works at a community college building bridges between underrepresented students and the world of higher education. And I'm gonna also make sure you know that she is a TEDx presenter and you should check out her TEDx talk. Up next is, I sure hope I haven't dropped these and, and changed the order. <laughs> Or read somebody else's bio for the, you know, for the moment. Um, I apologize. Savannah Smith. Got a, you got to like love life sometimes. Savannah uh, grew up in Renton, Washington, in an animal-loving home. Her early exposure to a variety of different creatures taught her that every animal, no matter the size or species, has its own unique characteristics and soul. Savannah is passionate about fostering positive experiences outdoors for Black, Indigenous people of color, especially in marine environments. Jayoon Kim graduated with a BA from the University of Washington. They have worked at nonprofits, Powerful Voices, and Young Women Empowered, and have facilitated many arts-based and social justice education programs for young people. Kim creates with various mediums, speculative fiction, poetry, urban mythology, performance, visual, and fiber arts. In 2015, they were invited to stay at Hedgebrook for a short-term writer's residency. And that is when I was lucky enough to meet them. So without fur further ado, thanks again to the Space Needle, Diane and Jamie for the videos we are about to enjoy. To navigate these waters, how big we must be. Stuck between seen and unseen. Breath of all kinds mingle. The orca blew life into my flame and it grew. When I catch my breath again, I'll control the fire within. 
Breath of all kinds mingle. But still, you tell me I'm not her. When I catch my breath again, I'll control this fire within. You can't douse me in the sea of my own emotion. But still, you tell me I'm not her. To navigate these waters, how big we must be. You can't douse me in the sea of our emotion, surrounded by all lands that touch all ancestors. To navigate these waters, how big we must be. Tell us we are winning, chasing this moment of togetherness, surrounded by all lands that touch all ancestors. Ancestors cheer for us, and we keep swimming. Tell us we are winning, chasing this moment of togetherness, beatings to our heart, but at least we know we're alive. Ancestors cheer for us, and we keep swimming. Seen or unseen, women or whale, we hear each other. Beatings to our heart, but at least we know we're alive. You want us dead, so our bones don't rattle our skin. Seen or unseen, woman or whale, we know you hear us. We're surfacing with a thunderous blow, disturbing your stillness, disrupting your silence. To navigate these waters, how big we must be. The orca blows life into our flame so it'll grow surrounded by all lands that touch all ancestors, stuck between seen and unseen. People of the whale, son of a prayer. All lands that touch all ancestors, where firefly light migrates into a luminous bay, as the beauty of bodies belonging to nobody are held in between braids in the son of a prayer. Where firefly light migrates into a luminous bay, People of the well stuck between seen and unseen, as if death is another metaphor for this life. People of the well stuck between seen and unseen. All I hear is a sailish sea calling us home, as if death is another metaphor in this life, chasing us in this moment. All I hear is my mother calling me home, as the beauty of bodies belonging to nobody chasing us in this moment. All lands that touch all ancestors, but all kinds of mingle, where I don't know a holy Bible but the palm of your hands. And then you tell me I'm not her. Are we forgetting the words and flesh? I don't know a holy Bible but the palm of your hands, so my bones don't rattle my skin. Are we forgetting the words and flesh? All human blood is bound to ocean waters, and my bones don't rattle my skin. Don't you feel it burning? All human blood is bound to ocean waters, so tell us we're winning, while this body is reborn again in the prayer of my grandmother. The influence of Grandma's ripple. Stuck between seen and unseen, honorariums for being resilient. You tell us we are winning, rippling words through whimsical waters. Honorariums for being resilient, chains of trash are tied around Grandma's neck. Rippling words through weathering waters, still gentle giants move gracefully through the sea. Chains of trash are tied around my neck. You tell me I'm not grandma's descendant. I move gracefully like a gentle giant of the sea. I am this water's new cycle. You tell me I'm not her. I am mixed with grandma's devotion and grace. I am this water's new cycle where all lands touch all ancestors. I am mixed with grandma's devotion and grace. My bones don't rattle my skin. Where all lands touch all ancestors, I find strength chasing this moment. My bones don't rattle my skin, where breath of all kinds mingle. I find strength within the moment. The legacy of shared waters wash over me. You tell me I'm not grandma's descendant, then you tell us we are winning. I am this water's new cycle, stuck between seen and unseen. What are the glimmers of hope in changing tides? Dormant dreams can awaken Mount Rainier on Coast Salish land. For now, an overseer directs Salish seas and mama's chasing the moment. A tragedy of gaze stuck between seen and unseen. 
Dormant dreams can awaken Mount Rainier on Coast Salish land. So songbirds cease to sing the blues for Chinook salmon, a tragedy of gaze stuck between seen and unseen. A requiem for home on all lands that touch all ancestors. So songbirds cease to sing the blues for Chinook salmon, echolocate missing and murdered women, a requiem for a home on all lands that touch all ancestors. In somber falsetto, when you tell me I'm not her. Echolocate missing and murdered women, scream the refrains, tell us we are winning at losing, eluding. In somber falsetto, when you tell me I am not her when you don't bring her home. Scream the refrains, tell us we are winning at losing, eluding. Divest from empty hands that betray breaths of all kinds that mingle when you don't bring her home. I remember so my bones don't rattle my skin. Divest from empty hands that betray breaths of all kinds that mingle to awaken Tahoma to remember. I remember her, so my bones don't rattle my skin, so my footprints don't complement murky seas. Echo locate missing and murdered women. For now, an overseer directs Salish seas and mama's chasing the moment. In somber falsetto, when you tell me I'm not her, what are the glimmers of hope in changing tides? Supplication to Wales. You tell me I am not her. All lands that touch all ancestors. You tell me so that my bones don't rattle my skin. Is an ocean just salt water or more whale, seaweed, and sand? All lands that touch all ancestors stuck between seen and unseen. Is an ocean just salt water or more rock, coral, rainstorm? On Turtle Island, U.S. worships defile the house of a local dragon god. Stuck between seen and unseen, gen seven generations rise to the surface here, enter oxygen breach memory. Off Turtle Island, U.S. warships defile the house of a local dragon god. Somewhere an auntie quietly makes offerings. Seven generations rise to the surface here, enter oxygen breach memory. Epigenetic grandmother codes our own basic nature. Somewhere an auntie quietly makes offerings, and I want to tell us we are winning. Epigenetic grandmother codes our own basic nature, a long past chasing this moment, and I want to tell us we are winning. And it's true, the wound begets the womb of infinite possibility. A long past chasing this moment, what a storm we've had, and so deep breaths of all kinds mingle. And it's true, the womb begets the womb of infinite possibility. In all of my lifetimes, I supplicate an ocean wisdom queen remain near to me, remain dear to me. Seven generations rise to the surface here, enter oxygen breach memory. You tell me so that my bones don't rattle my skin. Somewhere an auntie quietly makes offerings. You tell me I'm not her. Lullaby for sister whale and sister woman. All land that touches all ancestors. The shoreline is another kind of horizon. It claims us song of whale and melody of voice, the ether of sky cycles through sea, you and me. Shoreline is another kind of horizon, fluid, malleable, a border of mind. The ether of sky cycles through sea, you and me, stuck between seen and unseen. Fluid, malleable, a border of mind, you tell me I am not her. Stuck between seen and unseen, putrid pollution stretched upon water, upon blood. You tell me I am not her, so my bones don't rattle my skin, but skin will perish and bones will break through time, calcium of knuckle mimicked beneath sister whale's fin. So my bones don't rattle my skin, tell us we are winning calcium of knuckle mimicked beneath sister whale's fin, we mirror one another, shattered light refracted from within. Tell us we are winning before everything falls into disarray. Chasing this moment is time. Remember, breath of all kinds mingle. 
before everything falls to disarray in the songs of wail and the melodies of voice, breath of all kinds mingle on all lands that touch all ancestors. Okay, everybody come back now. Mm. Yes, yes. Just thank you all for your words and Jamie for the making the videos. And um, of course, the Pacific Science Center is where you saw the staging. And I don't want to forget to say thank you to them. I hope the audience, like me, can see everyone and and just hold this for a moment, our voices. Um, I feel really emotional hearing the poems again in, in a different context and after so many days. So, and so many days of so many things. I just want to say um, a quick thing about um, the pantoons, and then I have questions, and I'm guessing there'll be some questions from the audience. But as you all listened, you as the audience, um, you probably noticed the repetition of specific lines in all of it. And I want to tell you that um, the people that you see in front of you applied to be part of the uh, cohort for this civic poet work on civic poet work of of teaching poetry around this theme and i selected one line from each of the poems um, or letters or things they submitted and we decided collectively as we're becoming more collective in our consciousness to to take those lines from each other's work and weave them into the pantoon so not only is the the repetition of the pantoon represented, but also how our lives repeat, hopefully back and forth, as you saw. And uh, to tell you why as I feel it's important, and I'm inviting audience members to try the pantoum on their own, is um, in our collective existence, and in the existence of, of, of our endangered whales, there is repetition of a particular kind, of a particular um, traumas, of particular um, celebration of our mat matrilinear lives. We are the only two species on the planet that are distributed everywhere on the planet, workers and, and human beings. And we are the only ones who stay so long with, um, with our mothers if we if we are able let's put it that way so there's a lot that we have in common and um and so for me hearing this to say that the pantoum gives us a chance to really reflect on how um the roles of enslavement and historic trauma as well as our resistance and our resilience and our ri resilience and rising are entwined i hope it, it becomes clear um, I'm not sure exactly how the questions will pop up and I don't want to, I don't want to, oh my God, there's, there's 38 things in the chat. I do, I'll, <laughs> I, that's exciting. And I'm going to make sure that somebody else, uh, lets me know. I, I seem to be having technical difficulty when I go to the chat, then I get bumped out of the window. So we're going to hold that. Um, so I don't do that, but. Um, I would like to um, invite our panel to to ha to share, and everyone is going to talk. And I appreciate Rena and Donna, who um, are part of the cohort, but have stayed for this day and bring all of their passion and expertise to to this group to talk about. And I'd like Rena to start, especially because of being Lummy and the particular thing of the these whales being relations and then others to follow. What what um what for you is a 
personal connection. Not, yeah, what is a personal connection to the whales of, of Puget Sound, to the Puget Sound, uh, to the Salish Sea is the appropriate calling of it. I apologize. Um, well, I feel like the fact that they have a culture that is um, is is um, matrilineal and also dependent on the fishery, much the way straight Salish peoples were dependent on the fishery, is a deep connection. Our people call them our relatives under the waves. The word is Klohomachin. And, um, you know, in our stories, they are people that live under the water. And... Uh, so also in learning about them over the last few years, I feel more deeply connected knowing just how sensitive and intelligent they are. Um, understanding, you know, on a biological level, like how their brains work and how their emotions work. Um, it's just really tragic and horrible what we've put them through and so um, at the start of my journey, I, so I guess a little bit of background. I was awarded a National Geographic Explorers grant in 2018 to follow Lummi's efforts to repatriate Lolita or Tokatai, or as we've named her now, Scali Chakdanat from um, Seaquarium in Miami. And uh, so I was going to write, a, I did write about those efforts and also what I learned in the process of following that story. But when I initially was approached to, to, to undertake this task. I was not sure that I wanted to get involved. <laughs> I, thought, I remember thinking, oh, I don't know, like, I don't know if I could get into whales, right? Like, this is just like a very surface thing. And, and I was thinking, I don't know if that's my subject or my material or whatever. But then as soon as I started to like learn the story and learn about it it was like oh my god it's so deep and it's so it's such rich terrain um in terms of there's so much that we can do and there's so much to write about um there's just a lot that we can do to raise awareness and to raise people's um, consciousness around the subject of our southern resident killer whales so um that's that's I'll start. I think that's a good start for me. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, it's just yeah. a quick, quick, yeah. Quick question. So, is the art is that article something that people can find? And yeah, it's available. Um, it ended up getting picked up through uh, High Country. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, I put it in the chat. Oh, awesome! Art Thank in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was published in April last year, so almost exactly a year ago. Um, and I was really pleased with how they worked with me on that. And um, also, I'd like to say that the research that I undertook in following this story and learning about the greatest challenges to the Southern resident orcas led me to write a lot about salmon um, and, and the concept of reciprocity. And so there are other articles. I have one in Nautilus Magazine, and one in Adventures Northwest, and both of those are also available online, and then also one in Yes Magazine. So oh, yeah. it was kind of like a busy year of, of time, using all of that material that I gathered um, in 2018 and like 2019 and putting it out into some pieces that I hope will be enjoyed and be um, food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to let people um, self-select jumping in or uh, to answer that question. What, what, what's your intimate connection to the whales and the help in, and say, let's see. I can start. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for me, I feel like when we began this project, um, I 
was able to do a little bit of research just about, um, I feel like a lot of what we know about whales in general and just marine science is very much within like kind of a Western framework of um, viewing our connection to uh, these other beings. And so I was, uh, took some time to kind of just like look back at, oh, you know, like what is the folklore around whales like within my culture um, or with that, or like around Asia. And specifically, I was really amazed um, learning about, there's actually a temple in Vietnam that has like a whale skeleton in it. And there's uh, worship and prayers that are done um, for that whale and for whales in general. And then just being able to learn about, yeah, um, our respective cultures having so many ways of being able to be connected to whales in general and being able to be in relationship to uh, the natural world in general. So that was really inspiring to me. And then just, yeah, feeling a lot of uh, connection to water here, the Salish Sea has been such a like healing space for me personally. So yeah, just feeling a lot of gratitude um, to even learn now um, more with you guys today. Thank you. I can just hopefully you can hear me. Um, I can relate yep. to Jay and um, being inspired by the Salish Sea. Um, and so I'm from Chicago. Um, I grew up in the in the landlocked area, watching a lot of um, the animals and and the flora and fauna that are um, available on nature channels, um, and of course seeing uh, whales and and orcas and being inspired by them. But, and I also, um, when I got to uh, Seattle, um, or even before I got to Seattle, orcas were in every advertisement. Um, and, uh, and, and the sad part was when I got to Seattle, um, how much of that um, advertisement was an, an indication of abundance. Um, orcas weren't as a presence in the Puyallup they be, um, and so um, that uh, responsibility um, as a visitor um, and as someone who feels inspired by these landscapes um, is what really drives me, um, in just in some ways being haunted by the depictions of orcas everywhere and how. That is a very um, contrast, what, what the plight is. And so um, being able to use my voice in art um, and um, speak in a different way than orcas can um, is, is what inspires me. Thank you, Rashina. Your camera's off. I didn't know if you intended that for technical reasons, but I wanted to let you know. Who's next, please? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I can go next. Uh, my name is Ebony. Um, I'm originally from the Carolinas, so I haven't spent a very long time on the West Coast, but um, when I originally came to the West Coast, I was doing a marine environmental education in the Puget Sound, and I was working at a summer camp where me and, yeah, we were just teaching kids about marine science and how to use different water vehicles. But on the last day of the summer camp, um, I'm not sure which pot it was, but the orcas came through on the last day right underneath our um, pier. And it was like the closest experience. Like I could probably reach out and touch them if I, you know, was supposed to. Um, <laughs> but it was just a very unique um, experience to have just coming to the West Coast. And so that was just really inspiring, but I carried that with me into the learnings that I wanted to bring to the youth that we were working with. And once Jordan presented this opportunity to do poetry um, with this, inter this really unique intersection that I hadn't thought of before, it was just really inspiring to like hear about the stories of the well and get to know them on a more intimate level and trying to uh, understand our relationships to one another in that way. And so now I'm just inspired to continue to learn about them and grow and present that information to the youth that we work with every day. 
Um, but Savannah is my roommate and also a co-founder. And so that's what I refer to when I say sharing that with the youth that we work with. <laughs> I can go since okay. we're already on the same panel. Um, yeah, so my name is Savannah. Um, she, her pronouns. I'm from Renton, Skyway, Washington area. Um, very early on developed a, a connection to cetaceans, dolphins, and whales. Um, I always tell people that in my family, we had animals ranging from hermit crabs to peacocks. Um, so yeah, as you heard in my bio, just really early on felt connected to, to all animals. Um, but especially remember in second grade, starting to check out books about dolphins from the library and really getting interested in the ocean and what kind of animals exist there. Um, I've always considered myself a pretty curious and loving person. So I would say that I resonated with orcas in that way. Um, and when I was young, the idea was, oh, maybe I'll be like a whale trainer someday and like wanted to be as close to whales as possible. And growing up, learning how I could be close to whales um, emotionally. And I feel like this, this poetry cohort presented a really unique opportunity for me to explore that because I don't consider myself a poet and I haven't really written poetry before um, this, but I've started writing a lot of poetry after this actually. Um, but yeah, it allowed me to connect with the ocean and with whales in a new way and realize that I can be close to them and support them and advocate from them from a whole new perspective. So yeah, I guess that's my personal connection. Thank you. Thank you. Will you say the name of your organization? I don't think either of you did. Oh, yeah, sorry. Our organization is called Sea Potential, and it's focused on cultivating a full cycle of BIPOC representation in maritime. So one track is working with youth to develop those heart-based connections and kind of acknowledge the individual and generational trauma that BIPOC um, carry that could lead to some conscious or conscious negative biases towards marine environments, um, but also to highlight cultural resiliency and um, create positive experiences outdoors for them. And the other track is working with maritime industry businesses on the workplace culture to make them um, more inclusive and promote representation over assimilation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Savannah. Um, I can go next. Uh, yeah, I can go next. Um, but so I also, I didn't grow up in Washington. I actually grew up in Mexico. Um, and basically where we live, you had to drive like five hours to see the water. Um, so we only went to see the water, you know, once a year for vacation or anything like that. Um, but my family, I come from a family of farmers. Um, and, you, you know, if you could see like my grandfather, like anything that he touches grows automatically. Like he just has this way with the land and like, when I was growing up, I remember he would be able to tell like weather patterns, um, like it's gonna rain for 10 minutes and it's gonna be really hard. And I was like, what? Like I was always really shocked. And obviously as I grew older, I was like, oh, because so you're a farmer and you had to know this. But I think like it's deeper than that. Um, and I was always really envious about like, oh, how do you do that? How do you, you know, read the land and I like, connect with it. And then when I moved here, um, I felt really disconnected. Um, just from everything, you know, my culture, uh, where I grew up and in Seattle and Washington is really beautiful. But I think when you feel like constantly this place is really hard to admire that beauty and like immerse yourself in it. And I think it was until I started like more connecting with this land, like looking at it, like what is the history of it? And that I understood more like my role in here, like okay, I'm a guest in this land, what is my role? You know, you don't go into somebody's house and start like throwing stuff away or like sitting whatever, but you respect it and love it. And I don't know, have a deeper understanding to it. Um, and so also where Mexico and throughout Latin America, a lot of the people who protect the land are constantly persecuted, murder, uh, all of them, if not most of them are indigenous. And so when this opportunity came to be, um, the poem that I chose, I wrote about Berta Cáceres, who was murdered, and she was somebody who protected the water um, in Central America. And so it was a really, I don't know, I, I, I still remember when she was murdered because she was such a big figure um, and she was a mother and she really cared for the water. 
And when they would ask her, like, you know, what's going to happen, she would always reply with, like, we're going to win. Like, the river told me so. Like, we're going to make it through. And and around that same time, a couple years later, uh, I lost somebody I really loved. And, like, to deal with grief, I don't know why I wrote a short story about this woman looking for a whale. And it always felt like, oh, yeah, because whales are, like, the image of mothering. Or, I don't know, it reminded me a little bit of Berta. Um, and so when this opportunity came, I was like, ah, oh, this is so strange because I just been thinking about like mothering and land and, and connection and, you know, people who pass and how we grieve. And that's also when um, Talakwa was carrying her dead calf for se 17 days. And I just like couldn't stop thinking about like the mothers who are looking for their children in Latin America. And most of them are like defending the land or just standing for justice or just being who you are and going missing. And I just can't bear the thought of orcas going missing in here. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, I think no matter where you're from, you still have a responsibility to the land, to the water, and to the animals to, like, coexist together. Um, so that was it. I think that's my answer, yeah. Thank you. We can go next. Um, I think there, there are a lot of pieces for me that kind of dovetail with what everyone else has brought up. But for me, um, I did kind of grow up in the Puget Sound area, a little more inland. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up here my whole life. And I think I took the water for granted. And I went to school in eastern Washington. And after four years of that, I realized I need I need the coast, I need that that um, the Puget Sound. Um, and I think for me, the other piece of that is um, in the past few years, it's given me a sense of grounding. I've always really struggled with sense of place and sense of belonging. Um, I come from a Indian like Asian Indian background. Uh, it doesn't look that way, but that is that's that's the truth. Um, and I've always, you know, my parents immigrated here. And so I've often felt, um, just felt stuck between cultures uh, as the daughter of immigrants and also as someone who doesn't necessarily look like I'm from India. Um, there's a lot of identity struggle there. And also I think throughout my life, I've asked questions around like, what is it like if you have the experience of living on the land that your family and ancestors have come from? Like, I, I don't have that and probably will never have that. Um, and But one connecting factor, I think, as I've gotten older and um, try to find grounding in different places, because I felt like I'm not finding that sense of grounding in humanity and in people as much, but I, I found that as I kind of um, connected to sense of place, um, I felt this kind of, uh, just a sense of like, it doesn't matter which culture I belong to, I belong to the earth. And part of that for me is, you know, on one side, I have the Puget Sound, which is where I've grown up and the land that has nurtured me, the air that's nurtured me. And on the other side, um, my grandmother lives in the uh, coastal city of Chennai in southern India. And that's also right on the coast. We walk to the beach and you see nothing on the other side. And I, I absolutely love that. And there is something in recent years I found, like when I go to the Puget Sound, it just reminds me all that water is connected. Eventually, if you go far enough, I'll reach, I'll reach the coast that connects me back to where my grandmother is. And so those points of interconnection have been a place of grounding and something that I've been really yearning to explore more because I found that that's where, when you feel like you don't fit in with this, with all the divisions and the kind of categories that humans create, for me, it's been a reminder that we share space with so many other creatures like, you know, like whales and, um, you share land and like, there's there are no divisions and I think that's been something that I'm growing into as I get older and this workshop and this cohort was the perfect place to start to dive deep into that for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Donna I know you shared your story and, and I know if you wanted to add anything and then I'll then I'll go. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. I'm just so moved by everyone's stories and experiences. But I, I've been thinking about one of my favorite things to do on the whale trail is, you know, when the whales come by and helping people see them. 
and people change when they see the whales. They often start crying. They, kids go out of their skin. <laughs> They're so happy. And I don't, I can't think of anything else that's such a deeply universal experience. It cuts across everything. Everything that normally divides us melts away in the presence of the whales. And it also, it changes the way people experience this place. You see the orcas here and you never look at it the same way again. You understand whose realm we are in. And I feel so privileged to be able to create that experience for people, to help them have that simply by pointing to it, you know, helping them see the blow or the dorsal fin. And I was thinking how that's like poetry. Poetry at its best goes beyond, it's words that go beyond words. It evokes something that comes from the same place as what you feel when you see the whale, when it's really good, right? It, it, it's heart. What we heard so much here tonight, there's so much heart. The, the words are a channel for a deep, for a deep feeling and a deep truth. So I, I was just reflecting on that, the, um, how poetry goes to that deeper place. That's the, for me, it's the same place that where the whales are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to take the second to say I'm I'm I the I'm driven by the connection that I have not found out physically how it could be between my my uh match uh my aunt on my father's side who's now 98 years old, her sister died at 98. Um, but my father and died in his 60s, as did his brother. And my aunt, who's now 98, she had um, nine children, and she has outlived five of them. And when I un un began to understand what happens with our orcas, with, and I say ours, Perhaps that's incorrect to look at it that way, but it feels like that to me. Um, I see the similarity in my family all the way on the East Coast in Philadelphia near the Schuylkill, Schuylkill and Delaware rivers. So that's driven me to find out more. I still don't know the answer, what the grails, gray whales came to tell me, I believe, and, and I can say recklessly or truthfully and have asked scientists the questions, I believe what we are missing is that, that the gray whale's well-being is the actual answer for the orcas. And we're only looking at the salmon. I don't have all what I think of as the proof of that, but the, the abundance of them had to do something and we're missing the eel, the eel grass um, and the beds and the fertilized waters. I don't know that all of these things are true, but I wanted to share that with you. I do not know how to take the questions that are in the chat. And then um, um, I don't have a whale in captivity. That's my dog if you can hear <laughs> howling in the background, um, we'll watch the video. But I do want to take some question from the audience. And I do want to point out in that um, comment that was made that women, that Donna made, that women, that whales aren't just for entertainment. And I will say that is also to think of. And stay tuned for our next conversation about um, women and whales being points of entertainment the danger of that and how our lives, uh, I have an, our, an essay that had to, to change through a male lens uh, It's called Killer Beauty. I think that's the one that ended up in Sierra Magazine, but also air quality is another concern I have and would like to see us explore. So look out for, for our conversations and haiku in response to that. Jay, are you able to read a couple of the questions before we close with the poem? um the video poem and, and yeah so 
currently there's no questions um in the comments okay. i just posted to ask a couple minutes ago um but yeah i don't know if you have any more questions you want um to start for us or we could also just move on uh, no i am like shocked we're like on the minute so i don't want to be the one to mess it up <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. i was thinking that too <laughs> <laughs> but um i i do want to say um I mean, we we have invited ourselves to become a collective. I don't know exactly what it will mean as we work together. I know that I'd like to see us use our poetry to answer questions, um, like I said, about um, the gays, the gays that we're under, and, the, and as we know, the horrific violence that has happened, the violence of being separated, and also to remind us all that we, we must, if we're able to support the work of freeing the orca that is in captivity right now, and as a person whose ancestors were held in captivity, it's, it's, it's personal. It's, it's personal. Okay, so there's a consciousness that believes that, that uh, and, and human beings, were all were also put in cages for entertainment, and so it's it's one consciousness. So if we go forward, we will be exploring more, and we will use poetry. Um, haiku is the next up in my consciousness. So yeah, I want to um, show the video and then come back and thank you all again because it can never be too much, and then. Uh, then you should drink your mocktail and cocktail. <laughs> okay. In the box. In the body of the sound. Tell us we are winning so my bones don't rattle my skin. Is it only the whales with remnant appendages or are my children also my ancestors swallowing detritus. Tell me, so my bones don't rattle my skin. My eyes have been weaponized, like orca, like salmon, hungry. And are my children also my ancestors swallowing detritus, stuck between the seen and unseen? My eyes are weaponized like marrow, like salmon, hungry, like Henrietta Lacks. My DNA caged, stuck between seen and unseen, drowned in the body of the sound, like orcas filled with stones, like Henrietta Lacks, my DNA caged. You tell me I'm not her, drowned in the body of the sound, like orcas filled with stones, my body split, my body made to breed. You tell me I'm not her. When I look for your voice, a smooth black stone, my body split, my body made to breed. Breath of all kinds mingle. When I look for your voice, a smooth black stone, chasing this moment, breath of all kinds mingle. All lands that touch all ancestors, like Henrietta Lacks, her DNA caged. Is it only the whales with remnant appendages drowned in the body of the sound like orcas filled with stones? Tell us, we are winning. All right, we're almost on the minute and I hope I want to say thank you to everyone sitting here. I want to say, and my voice, I want to say thank you to everyone sitting here as part of this panel and this conversation and people watching. I don't know, it says there's 44 chats. I don't know who they are, but please forgive uh, if somehow we're not knowing that you've asked a question. Um, come back and email. Uh, you can check out urbanwildernessproject.com, the new site that Jay made, but there's also dot org. Um, who do I, what do I want to leave you in closing and saying thank you? I don't have my thank you page up, so hopefully I don't mess up. But it's Humanities Washington Office of Arts and Culture, the Whale Trail, 
Pacific Science Center. Uh, help me, Jay, if I'm missing anyone. Besides Jay and Carol and the Whale Trail. Space Needle, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I named the people Diane and Jamie, but yes, the Space Needle and Pacific Science Center. And I just feel like in all the community, Thank you, Rena. Thank you, Donna, for joining. Thank you, everyone in, in our cohort. And um, um, you will we'll look forward to the publication of the pantoons that were selected and new things to, to come in June as um, it is, is it whale month, June, Jay? Is that what it is? Great think one. June is Orca Awareness Month. Orca Awareness Month, sorry. Um, so yeah. And I'll leave you all to investigate anything that you came up with that you're curious about. I can be reached at seattlecivicpoet um, at gmail.com. And I also have to thank Irene Gomez, who is at the Office of Arts and Culture and for years has made projects possible for youth and and for, for the civic poets. So. Um, Peace. <laughs> And thank you all a thousand times. Bye. Hug so soon, <laughs> right?